Welcome to the Janine Boland Show, where we share tips from around the globe as we guide practical people with their finances using money tips, increase their incomes through side businesses, and maintain their sanity by staying in their creative zone. Hello, and welcome to the Janine Boland Show. It is great to have you with us. I always appreciate it when you take time out of your very busy Sunday to sit and just chat with us and also listen to what these amazing guests that I have on this show. And one of the things that I love about being on KHNC and getting syndicated this year is the fact that I have a bunch of radio show hosts on this station with me, and I couldn't help but drag them kicking and screaming, ha ha. No, actually, they enjoy being able to come on and talk about their shows. And so joining me today is Mark Tenowith, Executive Director of the Organization for New Civil Liberties Alliance, and John Vecchioni, who is a senior litigator for the firm. Now, the NCLA's public interest litigation and other pro bono advocacy strive to tame that unlawful power of state and federal agencies. There's a lot of talk about this. Even before 2020, we were seeing a lot of this, but boy, lately is something of a great import now. They are also the hosts of Administrative Static, an irreverent legal affairs show that exposes the unconstitutional administrative state within our own U.S. government. So Mark and Vec decry federal and state agencies agencies abuses they trot out those legal arguments they grill their expert guests and they bandy about the latest cases and controversies every saturday right here on khnc 1360 from 9 to 10 p.m or you can download the episodes on your favorite podcast app and so i just want to say welcome to the show it's wonderful to have you mark and Beck. thank you good to be with you yeah it's great to uh it's great to see another host Right, right. Because most of the time we do our little thing in our own booths and off we go. We don't get to see each other. So one of the things I really like to bring out is what was it that brought about this show? I mean, you have to have quite, you know, we have to pay for the time on the air. There are sponsors sometimes we have to get. Sometimes our sh- our guests will actually charge us to be on the show. It just depends on what you're doing. But you you doing a radio show every week, uh, this is a huge time commitment. A lot of people may not know that. And so you just don't do it for kicks, do you? I mean, you guys have a story behind this. So if you guys wouldn't mind each one of you identify who's going to go first and then kind of tell me, why did you even start Administrative Static? Well, this is Mark. I guess I'll go first. We uh, uh, at the New Civil Liberties Alliance, we are always looking for additional ways to get our message out and to educate the general public about the administrative state and some of the problems uh, that we uh, are encountering. And you know, a lot of people don't really understand what the administrative state is until they get caught in its, in its crosshairs uh, over you know, some decision that they've made or some, uh, something that's happening with their business maybe uh, that attracts the attention of one of those alphabet soup agencies in, in Washington, D.C., and usually if, if you've attracted the attention of one of those agencies, it's not a good thing uh, for you or your, or your business. And so we're, uh, uh, we're of the firm belief that a lot of these agencies are using unlawful forms of power. And we've certainly seen this, and we can get into that some more, we've certainly seen that in the last year with some of the coercion that's been, been taking place. Uh, but we just looked at administrative static as an opportunity to spread the message of what NCLA is doing uh, to a wider audience, including that increasingly large audience of folks who prefer to, to uh, you know, take their information in via podcast. And uh, the other thing is we're practicing lawyers. So we file briefs every day and we go into court. And certainly I do. Um, and, you know, some of that stuff's pretty dry. But on the other hand, um, some of the opinions and some of the things that happen are funny. So it's nice to be able to talk about something um, in a way that hopefully brings it to regular people. Um, you know, Justice Thomas always says he writes his opinions so regular people can read them. Well, on a podcast, hopefully you can explain things in such a way that it's not for judges or people who have already uh, learned everything they want to know about the law and have their own views. This is more for people who want to see what's going on and how this affects people's lives. And with the administrative state, um, it, it reaches into so many places. One of the things we do all the time since we broadcast out of Colorado is we highlight, um, on our last one, we just highlighted a water fight, right, that went to the Supreme Court. 
Colorado has a lot of Supreme Court cases with water fires um, between them and other states. Yeah, mostly uh, mostly my home state of Kansas. <laughs> and so, and so uh, we thought people might be interested in that. So sometimes we highlight that, but other other times we highlight things that NCLA is doing. Um, and we mainly represent individuals, uh, people who've been caught up in the maw of the administrative state. And I think their stories are always interesting. Absolutely. And then, you know, in terms of why I asked John to, to join me on the podcast is because he's my funniest colleague. So I wanted, I wanted to, uh, uh, we were kind of, uh, if I'm the straight guy, then, you know, then John, uh, John's a kind of the color commentary. You know, he spices you things always, up. So. You always have to have a color man. Thank you, John. I don't, <laughs> I don't have a whiteboard like Madden though. I just have to do it from <laughs> Well, if John, you if, if, lot, so. <laughs> yeah, you can, I'm sure you can definitely imitate him. So John, if you don't mind define for us what the administrative state is now, this is different than bureaucracy. So go ahead and just educate us. I like to start off with definitions. So we all know what we're talking about. So the administrative state is not the schoolhouse rock view of government, right? The Congress passes laws, the president executes those laws and the Supreme Court decides on their constitutionality or interprets what the uh, law means. That is how it's supposed to work. But with increasing frequency from the late 1900s to today, and I'd say really accelerating uh, in the 30s and then again in the 60s, uh, the court started to just let the administrative agencies, which were either just run by the president without congressional um, oversight or sometimes insulated from even presidential control, and the, the, the body of law that built up to allow the administrative state to do anything it wanted to you uh, is, is, you know, there's no, there's no Fifth Amendment. There's no jury trials. There's no, uh, there's many of the things we expect in the Constitution aren't there because this special body of law has grown up around administrative agencies and administrative power and their actions that is not rooted in the Constitution or how we expect laws to govern us. Because it's one thing when Congress says, you know, you, you can't build on this property, and here's why, and we're seizing it, and we're paying you for it, right? That's a taking. But when the administrative state says, well, we're going to let you keep your property, but we're going to tell you everything you can do with your property, so you don't even really own it anymore. Uh, and they've never got a law passed that said they could do that, and the president sometimes has no idea it's even going on. So that's the administrative state. It's the, it's the power that's been poured into these agencies extra constitution. And our focus at NCLA has been on people's civil liberties being violated by administrative agencies. So, so that's what we really focus on. Either we'll, we're, we'll defend people whose civil liberties have been violated if they're, if they're in an enforcement action, for example, or uh, if they're in the posture of a plaintiff suing an administrative agency, they'll be suing to try to prevent the violation of their civil liberties or, or the civil liberties of a larger group of, of people. Well, and that's a hot topic here in Colorado, because as we all like to say, water has caused people to get killed on more than one occasion. I mean, it is the Wild West, and people kind of giggle when I say that because they think of, you know, cowboys and all that kind of stuff in territorial disputes and all that. I'm like, folks, it's still going on. You just try to run a pipe anywhere in the state and see what ends up happening to you. <laughs> and I'm like, and, and water is still king. Everybody talks about electricity and oil and that sort of thing. Well, yeah, if you're in Ohio, but down here, it's definitely uh, water. So if you don't mind sharing a little bit about what you guys were talking about when it came to Colorado and some of the things you're seeing happen. Well, today's, I'll just tell you, today's topic was, you know, in a lot of this, I think there's even Supreme Court uh, cases that cite the old saying that in the West, whiskey's for drinking and water's for fighting over. And um, it's true. It's and so I, and true. I think that's, in, that's made its way into a Supreme Court case. I don't, I'm not oh. absolutely sure of it, but I'm pretty sure. Oh and uh, so the, it was um, Mississippi and Tennessee had a fight, not over a river, uh, which is how Colorado is usually fighting over rivers and how much water can come out, leave Colorado. And whether to pronounce it Arkansas or Arkansas, uh, as, as we do in the- in Hey, Canada. I'm from Missouri. I understand these things. <laughs> <laughs> so, what, so what happened is, is that Tennessee, uh, Mississippi claimed that Tennessee was, was taken groundwater that belonged to eight states and was taking too much of it, and that it was draining it out of Mississippi. Even though it didn't come into Mississippi, it just went down into the groundwater. And the question for the court was, uh, how do you 
how do you apportion that water among the states? And there's, uh, it, it, there's an equitable theory that they have that they apply to rivers that they applied for the first time in Kansas versus Colorado in 1906 when river, a river ran through it like the movie says. And uh, every state says all the water is ours while it's here and if it doesn't belong to anyone else. And Supreme Court says, well, that's not really how it works. It, it, it's a river that goes through all your states. So there's a, uh, we are going to equitably apportion how much goes to you under a way too complicated scheme that I'm not going to get into because, uh, frankly, I don't understand it. Um, but, <laughs> but, but, but the, the there, interesting- There are people who are water lawyers. Yes, exactly. In this. That and, is not us. And it, in fact, so the thing is, but the Supreme Court had to take it. One of the things we do here all the time is we file cert petitions or we file amicus briefs, friends of the court briefs saying you should take this because Supreme Court does not have to take every case. They can just sit on it and say, hey, well, let the appellate courts handle it and we'll just let it ride for a while. But this is original jurisdiction to stop wars between the states. The constitution says all these various uh, uh, cases between the states, the Supreme Court has original jurisdiction, so they have to take these cases. And they're the first one to hear it. And they're the first one to hear it. They don't, they don't have any facts from below. So as I said, they usually appoint a special master, which is either a lawyer or a respected judge to get all the facts from the parties. And then he, he, he or she reports that to the Supreme Court, but the Supreme Court doesn't have to take it. They can say, nope, we don't agree with that. We think this happened or that happened. I mean, they, they, they kind of have uh, just like when you go into a district court, they get to find all the facts. So does the Supreme Court. But I have never heard, or at least I don't know, of the Supreme Court actually sitting down and taking evidence. <laughs> they, 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 they're all appellate. By nowadays, they're all appellate lawyers. I don't think a, one of them was a uh, trial lawyer, right? So, I, uh, Sotomayor might be the closest. She was a prosecutor. There you go. All right. So you have that, and I guess I guess so was Alito. Yeah. So, um, but they, even there, there's no discovery. I guess you have, uh, you just have. Uh, you just have grand jury stuff. But the fact of the matter is, that's not a job they want to do. So they farm that out, and then they take the report, and then they go over it. But the states do have the power to sue each other. And that usually, if it's over land or water, it's original jurisdiction of the Supreme Court. It goes straight there. It, it occurs know- to me that one of our other cases that we have right now, uh, Janine, is a, that, that intersects Colorado, uh, is also a water case because we're suing the EPA over the Animus River. You remember when the uh, the EPA destroyed the Gold King Mine here a couple of years ago and turned the river orange in the uh, southwest? Yes, Park, why, why yes, I do. Yeah, <laughs> the river seen around the world. Well, we are uh, we're currently representing uh, a landowner near that river who the EPA, uh, without telling him, without announcing it, without getting his permission, just built a water treatment facility on his land. In order to treat the uh, you know the polluted river, uh, which you know ordinarily you would think the government has to pay you for your land if they're going to take it and use it in that way, but they haven't paid him anything. So we think that's a problem, and that's a another Colorado water case that we're and, involved in. And right it's now. called the Animus River. I had forgotten that. Yeah, the Animus River. Yeah, <laughs> that's good. That's a good name. <laughs> it is, isn't it? It's yes. A lot of Animus. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. True to true to form and true to its name. So one of the things that I remember from a lot of the constitutional law that I had to take when I was working on my master's was that we had to go back and study the old state constitutions as each state was formed and all that. And we had to read through a lot of those things. And one of the things I find more and more disturbing is the continual eroding of the state's rights or the state's power as the federal government. And a lot of time it's through finances, like when it comes to roads or infrastructure or something like that, you always see the federal government get its way by saying, well, we'll pull funding. Well, we'll pull funding. And so that is something where I'm looking at how can states get their some of their power back in in that get their budgets under control. And I'm always talking to folks about, is there any way you folks can at least get this county debt free? And then we'll work at the, you know, at the district level, and then we'll move up to the state level. But let's try to get the financial part of it under control, because then you don't have Uncle Sam pushing on you financially speaking, you can stand there like some of the cases of California, and go, fine, we won't pay taxes. <laughs> I mean, it's like, it's kind of like when you finally have a little, enough power to be able to get their notice. So 
didn't know if you guys had any commentary on that aspect of it because we see an yeah. inordinate number of presidential orders coming through, and that was supposed to be a last resort. Uh, like if you couldn't get Congress to figure it out and if you couldn't get any information from the Supreme Court, the president had the right to come in and say with presidential orders. But that is being used excessively at now to bypass uh, the administration. Yeah, it is. So. It's being used as a shortcut. And in fact, we did a we did a report. It's on the NCLA website, nclalegal.org. If people are interested in executive orders, uh, at the uh, conclusion of President Biden's first hundred days, we we did a retrospective uh, on all of the uh, dozens of executive orders that had been released in that in that first hundred days. And it's not even that 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 they're a last resort. It's that executive orders aren't supposed to be able to bind anyone outside the executive branch. So it's fine for the president to issue an executive order directing people, employees within his control in the executive branch to do things. That's fine. That's that's how executive orders are supposed to work. But way too often these days, the presidents are issuing executive orders that purport to do things like order you to do something or order companies to do something. That's that's not okay. That's not what the Constitution sets up as a way uh, to make law uh, that binds uh, other people. That that has to go through Congress, and by we call it bicameralism and presentment. Right, it goes through both houses of Congress, right. and the president signs it. Mm-hmm. Uh, and executive orders obviously don't follow that path, so they're not supposed to bind anybody outside of the executive branch. But uh, to, to your question about sort of states' rights types types of cases and the fiscal impact on the states. There's a very interesting set of cases working their way through the courts right now uh, over the uh, over ARPA, the American Rescue Plan Act that Congress passed earlier this year. And so there you're talking about something that did go through Congress. You know, it, it did go through bicameralism and presentment, but it still has an unconstitutional provision in it because the statute says that uh, that if a state accepts the the ARPA sort of the COVID relief funds, the ARPA the ARPA money then they may not use that money to cut taxes at the state level. Well, one of the main aspects of state sovereignty is a state's control over its own taxing and spending policies. And so for the federal government to come in and say, here's a bunch of money, but you have to give up your right to to cut taxes for the next three years or something like that, uh, that's a real violation of state sovereignty. And so, as you might imagine, many states have sued the uh, federal government over this provision, and NCLA has jumped into a few of those cases, uh, and so far they've all gone well from the from the state perspective. The Southern District of Ohio federal court ruled in favor of Ohio. Uh, the, the Northern District of Alabama has ruled in favor of 13 states, uh, which I think is a 13 seems like the right number of states to be suing over tax uh, questions. It just uh, exactly. I wonder if they kept of, people out. Yeah, no, you can't no, join no, no. us. You ruined our number. 13. We stopped at 13. Uh, but yes, because uh, you don't want those even numbers. That's unlucky, is what people yes. tell me all the time. You don't want even. And and to your so, state sovereignty has been whittled down, but the spending and the taxing are the holy of holies. I mean that, that even the Supreme Court. That's the one place it does not want to go. It says, well, what. The power to tax is the power to destroy, said John Marshall, and the uh, and the uh, Supreme Court thinks the power to take away your taxation and spending is the power to destroy states. So they do. That is the one thing I would say that the law is pretty good on that. Yeah, I mean the precedents are. I think that's why the cases have all been coming out the way yeah, they have. Exactly. So, uh, but that's uh, that's probably the most current example we have. And there's something called the uh, the non delegation doctrine, uh, which is. Uh, uh, I, mean, I guess you could say that it the the doctrine, or at least the name of the doctrine, was invented by the Supreme Court. But it it flows from Article One, Section One of the U.S. Constitution, which says that all legislative power shall be invested in a Congress of the United States. And so, all that the non delegation doctrine says is essentially, yeah, and Congress can't give that power away. So it's vested by the Constitution in Congress. Congress keeps the legislative power. They can't give it to the president. They can't give it to the courts. They're the ones that have to make those legislative determinations. And one of the things that is wrong with ARPA is that it has essentially it had very vague language about what would happen to the states if they didn't uh, or if they did raise taxes or and what a tax vague, cut was, what a tax cut is and what it would look like. And, and so the Department of Treasury put out a regulation that purported to clarify all of this. 
uh, that essentially turned the states into having to account for every dollar that they taxed or spent and report it to the federal government so that the federal government would be able to monitor them for purposes of compliance with, with ARPA. And so just that amount of interference with uh, with the state, kind of turning the state into auditors for the federal government and it's kind of is worse. a problem. It's kind of worse than this. The case is Yellen versus Ohio. And I don't think Commissioner Yellen wanted this power. Uh, Ohio v. Yellen. Uh, Ohio v. Yellen. Well, yeah, but it's up. It's gone well, up. Yeah, so it reverses. Sure, sure, yeah. Yeah. So I don't, I don't really think she wanted it. But what the federal government said is, well, there might be problems with the statute, but the administrative state through Yellen is going to fix all the problems. She'll 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 administer it in such a way that won't be unconstitutional. So uh, her regulations will fix the statute. Well, that's not how it works because she can only issue regulations that the statute is already yeah, authorized. Exactly, and yeah. and from a constitutional perspective, and I do. This is what I usually find that you know in the cases of Sarah, usually the administrators seem like they really really want to push this this administrative position through. And if you see them on TV, they're always like, this is the greatest regulation on earth. And I, of course I can do this and I should do this and the court should stay out of it. And they're like very vehement. We're experts. Yeah, we're yeah. experts. And I have to say, Yellen's been kind of quiet. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah. I, I feel like they've been thrown under the bus. No offense, but here you go. You're going to fix it all. It's all going to be fine. We're just going to get it passed through. Thanks for throwing me under the bus, boss. Appreciate that. So, yeah. Exactly. yeah. So these are things that you folks are kind enough to bring about and say on the radio waves because a lot of stuff does get ushered to through pretty quickly. And one of the things, um, my background is analytical biochemistry, and so I worked a lot with the FDA, and we were trying to get things taken care of before we ever trotted into legal affairs because that's when it got very expensive very fast. And so everybody wanted to kind of play nice, nice before that. But it was amazing to me to see these reports that would come out that were anywhere from 18 to 2,800 pages that no one would read through because they were great for insomnia and a lot of times couldn't understand what was being said because there's a lot of words on the page, but nothing is very clear. So one of the things that is helpful is folks like you in the NCLA, at least you bring it to a language we can understand because um, how many years did you guys spend learning your own lingo in legal ease? Well, right. It's been three years of law school, but it's all that time spent. I, I've spent, I guess, five years in the federal government at, in different, different stints. That's the real damaging time. You start to learn all of the acronyms and right? then, you can, then you can bamboozle anyone. Right. Because it's all acronyms, like you say, and it's the same thing in science or any other institution or any other sort of career path is that you have this insider language, so to speak. And so then the uh, common person or uh, Vox Populi, if you say the man on the street is, is lost in the, in the shuffle. So as a folks like yourselves, what are some things that um, I always like to say, what is it that a person can do, right? It's all very good to have wonderful people like yourselves that are watchdogs for things and you're, you're letting us know, hey, this is not appropriate. This is not appropriate. But at the same time, I sit here as a homeschooling mom of four and I have a little online university. Uh, what, what does somebody like me can do with all this? So did you guys have any things that you recommend for folks well, to, how do we stay in touch with that? I have I have a couple of things. First of all, you you can um, you can fight the regulatory state. Uh, it's expensive, but you can find people to help you uh, if you have a good case. But I also think there's always a, a war of two sayings in the United States, and one of them is there ought to be a law, and the other one is it's a free country. And when those two things are at war with each other, but they're very common sayings, and um, I think that when People, regulators or, or politicians or lawyers are saying, oh, there ought to be a law and everyone ought to go along with it. Um, I don't think that should be the default. The default should be freedom. And um, so I don't be so fast to say, oh, the government should do this or the government should do that. Because if you are fast to say that, the government's going to do it. And um, you, you may not like the results. So one thing is to listen to what people say they're going to do and look into the weeds of what actually happens then and why they have that power. Because one of the things we do, we sometimes sue state governments in administrative law that, that they've done something wrong, but, it, but at least the states usually have, uh, they can say, we do have this power. They either point to a part of the constitution or they say we have the police power, which people can argue whether or not they should have the police power. Maybe it comes from kings and maybe they shouldn't have that. Um, but 
at least the Supreme Court has said they do. The federal government, it only has the power that comes out of the Constitution, and then the agencies only have the power of the animating statutes. So making them always say what animating statute gives them the power to do this is the Achilles heel of the administrative state. And I think that question always has to be asked. And one other thing, they ask for comments. If you're in an industry and you know that there's comment, they're asking for comments on a rule, for God's sake, comment. If you, all you have to do is send them a letter saying this rule is bad because it will affect me this way, or this rule is good because it'll affect me this way. But um, there's a professional commentary in DC and all the lobbyists are there. But if you're in an industry, you're, you're perfectly fine. You don't have to be a lawyer. You don't have to have a bar. You don't, you, you could just write a letter saying this will, this administrative proposal will have this, this, and this effect. And often you can belong to um, your local business group or your local union or, and they'll tell you these things are coming down the pike. So uh, you can watch it yourself, but usually there are groups that watch them in your area and you can then just comment and at least that'll be in the record. And if they don't pay attention to that, the courts will strike it down for not answering that response in their administrative processes. Yeah, I think those are good examples, John. And, and I think uh, I mean, what maybe one of the biggest disappointments, Janine, uh, of being with an organization like the New Civil Liberties Alliance is we can't help everyone who, you know, who calls us or sends us an email ask, asking for help. Uh, because what we're really trying to do is set precedent and, and bring cases that are going to help the maximum number of people. Because we have limited resources, we really can't devote those resources to one-off sorts of cases or opportunities. We have to find cases where we can take away a particular tool or tactic of the administrative state that is being used to violate lots of people's uh, civil liberties. So we hear about cases all the time where someone's really getting shafted, but it's just not the kind of case where uh, you know it's going to affect anybody else in the same way in the future. And so those cases don't fit our, uh, you know, our remit, but uh, those are good candidates, hopefully for maybe a, a local attorney to help somebody out on a pro bono basis or, or something like that, because uh, uh, there, there are a lot of civil liberties violations uh, happening. And uh, you know, we like to say it's a target rich environment and we can't, we can't do it. We can't take all the cases that we hear about. But on the yeah. other hand, sometimes there's a regulation you want to challenge and businesses will not challenge it. My fourth grade teacher used to say, Mr. Vecchioni, stick to your guns. And I'm Mr. Pass. I'll never forget. She always says that when you're being wishy-washy. And I, well, you took that to wish. heart. Yeah. <laughs> and I do wish. You've done very well. <laughs> I, do wish, I do wish that some companies would stick to their guns, but they're, sometimes they even think they can win. You talk to these people, they think they can win. They think it's bad. They think they'll be, but they just think that the, that the let's use the animus of the, uh, 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 of the agency will be such that they can hurt them in so many other ways that they don't want to bring a case. And so what you find is that you can't find that plaintiff who's affected to get standing to then attack the rule because they're afraid of what else might happen to them. And that's really a terrible um, commentary on our country and on the administrative state, because whatever you do in court, you shouldn't worry about the agency coming back at you for some other reason. Right. I think that's where Hollywood has done a disservice to a lot of things in multiple industries where Hollywood has made it seem that way. Um, I do know that, like you said, there's always an organization you can go to because even now they have a national whistleblowers organization that will help you legally, financially. They guide you on before you bring this into the public eye, before you shine a spotlight on this very dark, grubby mess that you see in this institution, you may want to consider XYZ PDQ and they run them through a whole list. And so like you guys, you have a network, you have people that you can refer other folks to because you, like you said, you can't carry all, all the cases. We, well, that's the alliance part of it. Although I do want to comment on Hollywood. You know, Ghostbusters is coming out, and that one has the EPA administrator as a bad guy. So I, I'm not going to just throw it uh, completely under the bus as as Ghostbusters is coming out. But, uh, but in, in, in any event, we do have, you know, there are certain things we don't do that we refer cases out to, certain religious liberty cases, certain, certain freedoms that um, Second Amendment stuff that there's a lot of organizations that do that. And they often have to do some administrative state stuff because that's who's, that's who's coming after them. Right. In fact, uh, you know, getting back to sort of what led to the founding of NCLA, uh, our, our founder, Philip Hamburger, is a professor at Columbia Law School in New York. And he uh, 
wrote a book back in 2014 called Is Administrative Law Unlawful? Short answer, yes, but it's an 800-page book. I, I recommend it uh, to you. He calls it his doorstop. He read stop. the last page. <laughs> <laughs> right to the end. Uh, Skip but, to the end. You want to know who did it. <laughs> that's right. That's right. Uh, but you know, folks, the, the book was well-received, particularly in the limited government community, but folks said, well, Philip, what are you going to do about it? And he had done a lot of work uh, religious liberty scholarship earlier in his career and was aware of some of these public interest groups that help people out with uh, with uh, free exercise uh, claims when they feel like their religious liberties have been violated. And he thought, well, what, what would it look like to set up a group that was like that, except devoted to protecting people's civil liberties from the administrative state? And he talked to some of the religious liberty groups and said, well, what, what would you think about that? And the reason why they were really enthusiastic and encouraged Philip to follow through and set up an organization like NCLA is because their experience has been recently, it is the administrative state that's the one that is trampling their religious liberties. It's not typically Congress or state legislatures passing laws, because when state legislatures pass laws, for example, on lockdowns or something like that, you'll notice that the state legislature will typically put in an exemption or a reasonable accommodation for religious exercise. It's when you have these uh, sort of single-minded administrators who are coming up with rules and regulations that they are the ones who trample religious liberty and other civil liberties and don't provide for those sorts of accommodations. So uh, we've really seen that uh, in, our, in our practice over the last uh, four years as well. And that's one of the things we'd like to talk about on our show. So can you kind of give us a little bit of a preview for your next season on, you know, we, we're in a world pandemic, there's all kinds of perspectives, and everybody, of course, has the right one. And so I was just kind of curious, you know, this has had to have been just wonderful grist for the mill of your show. Well, I, I will say we've done a lot on vaccine mandates. And um, I don't know if we're in a pandemic anymore. I think it's gone to endemic. Um, ah, are we? It's epidemic now? Ende- endemic. It's a it's endemic. A that will, okay. Be around like the flu. It's, it's okay. Gotcha. Anywhere and, and so the responses there are um, the government still is call, crying emergency all the time, regardless of how full the hospitals are, regardless of what's happening on the ground. They just say it's an emergency. And, and I think some of the pushback is the courts have to decide whether they just take that at face value or not. And we've got to see what they'll do there. Um, because it, in the federal government's area, they have a lot they can do. I mean, they can, they can make certain drugs available quicker. Uh, they can spend a lot of money to ma- make sure vaccines come out fast. There's lots of things the federal government can do. But Law- lawfully. Lawfully. Yes. But, but uh, they, the administrative agencies, and sometimes the president wants to push them, and, and this is the president of two administrations now. We've seen it in the CDC uh, uh, eviction moratorium that was put out under the Trump administration has continued under the Biden administration. And there was nothing in the CDC. Uh, the CDC is not allowed to control housing in this country. Okay. Newsflash. And uh, it's the center for disease control. It's not the center for rent control. And um, I, I think that those agencies just say, oh yeah, we can do this. And they do it one, because the statute is either poorly worded and they say it's broad, broad authority. So it all fits in here. Um, or they just want to do it. And they say, well, we think we can do it and stop us courts whenever you get a chance. And the administrative state moves faster than the courts do. I mean, that's one of the frustrations. Or the Congress. Or the, faster than the Congress, too. Uh, and you know, that, that sort of dispatch uh, is useful in some contexts, but when it's being used to violate people's civil liberties, it's really, it's really a problem. And the, maybe the, the biggest concern I have right now is Congress passed a statute called the Emergency Use Authorization Statute. And that statute allows for vaccines uh, to be offered to people, even though they haven't been fully FDA approved. But that statute also explicitly says that people have the right to informed consent and to refuse administration of an emergency use authorization vaccine. But what we've seen is uh, despite that statute, guidance and agencies have been putting out uh, advice or putting out regulations in the case of OSHA, the Office of Legal Counsel, the Department of Justice has put out an opinion saying, well, that's not what the statute says. Uh, The statute, the statute says that, that, uh, that the person who's giving you the vaccine has to tell you that you have the right to refuse the vaccine, but you don't actually have the right to refuse the vaccine. 
or at least you don't have the right to refuse it and not lose your job or not have these other negative things happen to you. Uh, I think that's a terrible reading of the statute. And I think that when Congress, and com by the way, Congress passed the statute, this isn't some ancient statute, Congress passed the statute in around 2003, when they were worried about anthrax and some of the post 9-11 uh, threats that were coming about and wanted wanted to be able to give people quick access to experimental drugs if you know if necessary. But the idea to take that statute and turn it into forcing experimental drugs on people who don't want them, uh, I, I just don't think that's what Congress you know had in mind at the time. So there's going to be a lot of battles over that uh, in the coming year. And, and I think that this emergency, what, what constitutes an emergency may be coming out because we have seen with the Supreme Court and most of the courts we've been in, um, in the first three months from March to, uh, to, from March to December last year, you didn't want to be moving against anything the government did on COVID because, you know, no judge wants to be the guy who allowed all these people to die and, and, and the germ, the, the, the um, virus to just go all over the place. You don't want to be that guy and, and it's an emergency and you don't have the knowledge that that the executive has. So you go, whoa, 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 sorry guys, I'm waiting on this. Or you or you say this is in their purview. But eventually, you, you know, emer all of life can't be an emergency forever. So I, I think we're going to start seeing some more activity. And we have, I, I will say this, the CDC uh, moratorium on evictions took a year and a half to get struck down by the Supreme Court, maybe almost two years, really, yeah. a year and a half. 15, 15 months, 15 something months. like that. Yeah. Um, but the, uh, the OSHA rule, which was even, uh, if anything, wilder, uh, that OSHA could do this, um, that got struck down lickety split. And less, less, just this week, uh, the government said, lift the stay, because it moved from the Fifth Circuit to the Sixth Circuit. And the government said, oh, new court, new chance. So they filed this thing. I don't think that's how it works, but we'll see. <laughs> I like yeah. the way you keep saying that. That's not how the way it works. Or this is the, you know, they keep trying to play outside of the lines, and that's Actually, just not where you are. Mark and I had a discussion. He thought certain of the judges would take a new chance. And I said, nah, none of them are going to jump at this. So we will see. We will we'll have the chance to see when the court rules. We do feel like <laughs> Schoolhouse Rock needs to be uh, you know, revisited and and uh, and retaught to a whole generation of they should of, play it every day of bureaucrats that don't seem to <laughs> they, they seem to have missed the 1970s somehow but uh I, I know my kids will still sing you know i'm just a bill to you they will sing the song to you it's it's, it's one of those fun fun little aspects of it well, we have about four minutes left here on the show. So what are some recommendations that you guys can give or kind of let us know where you're headed with the show particularly? Because, you know, now that we have the endemic, you know, are there areas that you guys have a spotlight on? I'd love each of you to give your own opinion on this, please. Yeah, well, you know, one thing that we like to, to showcase on the show is whenever we have victories uh, in court. Mm -hmm. So, you know, that's usually if, if you have a victory, that's that's. Uh, well, it's 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 a positive development for civil liberties on, for one thing, but it also shows that you've reached some sort of, uh, of endpoint with with litigation that you've been involved in. So we have a few cases in the pipeline that we are hoping to be able to report uh, victory news on here, uh, in the coming year. So, uh, for example, we uh, we have a lawsuit uh, against the uh, uh, ATF over the bump stock ban uh, that they put into effect. Not because we have a policy position on on guns or on or on bump stocks per se, but just that we don't think the ATF has the ability to outlaw those as a matter of regulation. We think Congress has to outlaw them as a matter of statutory law, uh, and so that issue has been been percolating, working its way up uh, in the courts. The courts have disagreed about that issue. That's one thing that we'll get a decision on here, in relatively short order. I, I fingers hope. crossed. We have a case down in the Gulf. We have a class action where we're, we're representing an entire class of charter boat fishermen. And the question there is whether or not they have to put a tracking device that says where they are at all times that goes back to NOAA and back to the Department of Commerce, even though they're reporting all the fish they catch and everything. So I, 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 I'm hopeful that that And boat captains tend to be independent people. This, yeah. may, this may not surprise you. Oh, you yeah, think? <laughs> Yeah, you're not big on this. Yeah, you talk idea. about people wanting to get out of the nine to five. They they <laughs> they kind of want, I think, the six thirty to three. Uh, right, <laughs> that is where they live. Yes, sir, exactly. But in any event, so um, and and there's certain others. I will I will say this. One of the things 
that I'd like to focus on just in general, and I'm looking at a case on it now, is the administrative agencies affect your contract rights a lot of the time. That's what we saw in the CDC uh, eviction moratorium case. And, and the Supreme Court has been very lax on contract life. I mean, the law is just, I read it sometimes, and then I read the Constitution, and I'm saying, does anyone know English? Do, do, has, did they learn English? And, and you said you learned about your state constitutions in law school. I don't know when you went to law school, but we never heard of a state constitution when I was in law school. So that was that's good. That'd be nice for them to read those too. So, uh, but actually, since I just wanted to get the federal constitution right, I'd be happy if they just used the You'd words there. I'd settle for that. So <laughs> uh, maybe we'll see something on the contracts clause if the agencies do it rather than uh, Congress. So that'd be good too. Uh, I don't have any case in mind, but I, I just been looking at it and uh, that'd be good to do as well. But we have about 40 cases in the pipeline right now. So if folks are interested in that, again, nclalegal.org is, is our website. People can learn all about the different cases we have going against uh, uh, probably two dozen different federal agencies that we've filed lawsuits against in the past year year or two. Yeah. And if somebody had and if somebody had a case that they wanted to see if you guys would work on, do you have a contact us section on there? Not not really. Uh <laughs> And the reason for that is we're already inundated with more cases than we can, than we can take. Uh, but we do get uh, people do find ways to reach us. And, and uh, with, so please, uh, Janine, don't give out our email address. Is that what I'm hearing? <laughs> please, Janine. There is a contact thing. Well, okay. But, you know. Yeah, I'm pl- I'm playing with you. I know I understand that. Anyway, thank you, gentlemen. It is always lovely to be able to hear people from inside the Beltway who are trying to make um, decisions and also broadcasting what's happening to those of us who are dealing with daily life outside of the Beltway. And sometimes it gets a little incestuous in there and the nightly news doesn't share the whole story. So thank you for giving us a different piece of the story, something that is coming from you guys. So we appreciate that. And with that, thanks so much for listening. Welcome to the Janine Bolin Show, and I have a special guest with me today, Michelle Moras. Now, Michelle and I have only really known each other since 2018, but we definitely feel like we're sisters from the different mothers or however that wonderful tribal saying is that she uses all the time. Uh, But one of the things we wanted to share with you guys today was this 100 Authors event. And as you know, I'm a double-digit author. I'm working on book number 12. Uh, Michelle herself has written multiple, multiple books. And the thing is, is we really like supporting and mentoring our other authors. So, Michelle, welcome to the show today. Thank you for having me. I'm (laughs) really excited to be here, actually. It's really nice. (laughs) So one of the things I wanted to share with uh, folks was about the 100 author event. Talk to us a little bit about what it is, but really what's the story behind the story? What got you into that anyway? The story behind the story, we have to tell that one. I launched two books in the same week from two different publishers, and both of them wanted me to have a launch party. And I don't like being the center. Yes, I'm a speaker, but I don't like the attention on me. And I said, I'm not going to do two book launches. It's just it doesn't feel right. And they said, well, what do you want to do? And then one of the publishers said, well, why don't you do a, a, like a, a, an author event and invite all your friends who are authors. And then you all celebrate together because they're going to come to your launch party. Anyways. I said, that's a really good idea. He has call it a hundred author. That's a, that's a nice round number. Like, okay, we'll do a hundred author. So that's what happened. I was supposed, I was launching my books the same week. So I made a hundred author, but I didn't want it to be about me. I wanted it to be about everyone else. And that whole rise, you know, rising tide raises all the ships. If I could have all those, that the photography in there and the people videoing me, they would be able to do all that for everybody else too. So my thought was they're there for me, but they might as well get a couple of shots of everybody else because that way we can up-level any of the authors that are there. So the 100 author event is about authors coming together to conspire, to partner, to help each other and learn from each other. And that's what the Colorado Springs one was about, was bringing us together so we realize we're not alone. Authors like to write books and then put them in a shelf. And my thought process is, 
it's not just a book, it's your business. So we need to be able to figure out how to manipulate your book and in your message, because I'm a messenger, I help people write messages and write their speeches. How do we make it so you can grow from it instead of just putting it on paper and letting it collect dust? And then uh, we get everyone in the room and everyone was so excited. And I said, hey, stage time, get up on that stage and talk for a few minutes about why you wrote your book and what your passion is. And that set a lot of the authors that were there on fire for more. And I'm like, oh, we're on to something now. And in that process, I said, wouldn't it be great if all the authors in this room who didn't have a website could be connected to someone who could build them a very simple website with their book? Yeah, we're recording them. What if we like take the audio or do some kind of a podcast? And then Janine walks in the room. Ah, we have a podcast. I mean, so basically it's how do we develop authors so that they're not just a one book author that no one ever reads their book, but to up level them so they really become that part of their brand and they're out there and sharing and getting on stages and talking about their book and getting on more and more podcasts. I see it as just this huge blooming flower of amazingness. So all of us solo authors who are doing our thing aren't alone anymore. We can work on each other and help each other. And what I just realized, I didn't just, but a couple of days ago, I want to bring in expert speakers. So when we do the 100 author event, make it, I only made it four hours. I want to make it five hours. And then that first hour would be, you know, VIP, you can buy a ticket to talk to John Maxwell for an hour, you know, or come in and talk to um, JK Rowland for an hour, you know, that kind of thing. And that way it's a up level. We can learn from other people. I've got a lot of ideas going on in my head and um, I'm glad no. It was a good event. It was, the Colorado Springs was a very good event. But like you said there, this is the core group and it's going to go from there. And already, how many additional events have been orchestrated now? You've got there's, Dallas there's, coming up. Well, Dallas is November 30th. Right. And, and Las Vegas, it looks like there'll be two of them back to back, December 8th and December 9th. One will be at a hotel. The other one will be at a bookstore. And then the one in January right now, we're working in Orlando. March will be DC somewhere. April is London. <laughs> nice. <laughs> so what started as an idea that was just uh, trying to solve a problem, which is one of the things I love, is you're just trying to solve a problem of two books, same week, two different publishers, create an event. The next thing you know, you've gone international and you haven't even really tried. So bravo. And you also have a new award. I want everybody to know about your new award back there. Talk to us a little bit about that. It was named after you. It was named after me and my tagline. So it's uh, the Unapologetic Award. And it was given to me by well, I won an award in July. I com uh, competed at the ultimate speaker competition and I won the ultimate speaker. And I kind of, I'm very unapologetic, but I'm also very energetic. And I, I tend to, yeah, you can see it, that kind of energy that I bring around. And the creators, Christoph Weinman and Michelle Weinman, said that I deserve something special to be recognized for what I do and the efforts I, I bring to that environment. I love speaking and I love bringing messages out. And so they gave me the first annual Michelle Moras Unapologetic Award. And it's basically what Michelle says, it's the flame in my soul, the light that I give and I share with everyone else. Isn't that beautiful? I think it's beautiful. And that's why when people are like, Janine, why are you always mentioning Michelle? And why are you always mentioning these awards and everything? I said, because I'm so proud of her. I, I, I'm like, if you have any idea of her background, if you had any idea of what she has been through, you know, she doesn't look like what she has been through. Right. She actually looks really, <laughs> really laugh. And that's why I wanted to share that. But anyway, this was just meant to be a little quick inspiration for you to know that there are authors out there that know how you are struggling and we want you to do better. And there are events and people who their sole purpose is to help mentor you. I want you to and raise you up and help you with your message. I want you to look into Michelle Moras. We'll have a button below so you can see what the new events are for the 100 Authors event. If you've never been to any 
anything like that, take your book and your shaky knees, and I know you're nervous, and get out there and join an event like this. Thank you so much for listening. And Michelle, thank you for your time. Thank you so much. Thank you for listening to The Janine Boland Show. Be sure to subscribe to our show notes by going to thejanineboland.show.com where you'll find additional resources as well as the opportunity to sign up to receive our program in your email each week. Be sure to visit our sponsor at the8gates.com.